In 586 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed. The people had gone so far from God. They lost everything. Their homes were in ruins. Their families separated. Their temple was destroyed. The nation of Israel was no more. But God said years before through the prophets, I will bring you back home. I will forgive you and restore you. God promised them hope. That he would restore. That he would forgive. That he would be faithful. God's people came back from exile. This is the story of their return. Hello and welcome to our study in the book of Ezra. How are you all? I hope you're doing well. I hope and I certainly pray that you're doing well. It's a bit of a strange time for all of us just now, uh, what with the lockdown. Um, I mean, you have to wear a mask to get money out of the bank nowadays. And there's been a new torture technique that's been discovered, um, and it's called homeschooling. And I'm sure for all of us that have been involved in that, know exactly how awful that is. But it's good that we can come together, take time out, and study God's Word. And it's good doing it in this medium because you can go and get a wee cup of tea and just get your the Word out and read and study along. But you may ask yourself, why on earth are we going to be studying Ezra? Well, since the end of last year, I believe God has laid on my heart the time period after the second, well, after the Babylonian captivity. Now that's covered in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and Esther. First and Second Chronicles are written in the time period, or this time period, but they refer to events that happened before the captivity, at least up until the last two verses of Second Chronicles, which are the same as the first two and a half verses of Ezra. And as we study this book, you'll see that it's about God's people returning to him and how they can worship and live for him. And I feel it provides a number of insights for us to live for God in the 21st century. Specifically, this book can teach us about hope and about restoration. Despite Israel rejecting God and going after idols and being faithless, God is faithful and brings his people home. And also God has a greater perspective than ours. We can only see what's in front of us, our lives, our home, our work. Um, but God sees the bigger picture across time And he knows, as Paul said in Romans 8, that all things work together for good, even if we can't see that in our lifetime. And throughout the book, you see that having faith in God and following him is not something to be played with. It's serious. It demands commitment. It demands uh, belief and action. So that is what we're going to be looking at. But as a way of introduction, we're going to have a look at the book and also the kind of history and prophecies that go before it. But before we get there, it's interesting to see what other things were happening in the world as the book of Ezra took place. Because uh, during the same time period, uh, in India, uh, you had somebody called Buddha and he was uh, teaching. And also in China, you had Confucius, who was also teaching. And in Greece, you had a gentleman called Socrates. So throughout the world, these new philosophies and ways of thinking began to appear that continue to influence our, the world our day, or the world to this day, I should say. So even though two and a half thousand years ago seems far away, even from a secular point of view, we're still seeing the, the effects and the impact of it. But just as a start, as an overview, the book of Ezra has ten chapters. The first six deal with uh, Zerubbabel who led the first return of of God's people to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and the city. Eighty years later, Ezra led Jews back to Jerusalem and he put in reforms about the worship of God. Thirteen years after Ezra, Nehemiah came to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. And as a matter of interest, the events of the book of Esther took place between chapters 6 and chapter 7 of Ezra, just to give you some context. Again, let's have a look at the history of Israel, just a brief history to see where Ezra comes in the biblical narrative. 
So you remember uh, King David and King Solomon. They ruled over a kingdom, a united kingdom, where the country's boundaries were extended. They had um, military victories, spiritual success. Um, it was a time of growth. However, when Solomon died, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two separate nations. The ten northern tribes called themselves Israel, and the southern tribe of Judah and Benjamin called themselves Judah. The kings of the north, uh, as it says in the book uh, Second Kings, certainly, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. There was none that worshipped God, but they all worshipped idols and encouraged their people to do so. Examples of kings would be the likes of King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Now, the southern kingdom was a bit better. They did have some good kings, such as Uzziah, Hezekiah and others. But the majority did evil in the sight of the Lord. Not only did they worship idols, but they mixed that with worshipping God. So during the feast days, during the times when they had to sacrifice, that's exactly what they did. And they sacrificed the way they should have. But then afterwards they went and they worshipped Baal and Ashtoreth and the idols. And it was that mixture that really uh, got God uh, angry. And at this time, many of the prophets we know uh, were ministering during the time of this divided kingdom. Elijah and Elisha, they ministered to the northern kingdom, as did Amos and Hosea. In the southern kingdoms, you had Jeremiah, Isaiah, Joel, Micah, and others. These prophets warned and warned and warned that God would take the people, his people, into exile if they didn't come back to him. The northern kingdom consistently ignored the warning and Assyria took them into captivity in 724 BC. And as world powers do, eh, power changed and Babylon conquered Assyria and became the most powerful empire, not only in the region, but in the world at that time. And unfortunately, the southern kingdom didn't listen to the warnings of the prophets. So God spoke through Jeremiah and told him the consequence of turning away from him. So let's look at that text in Jeremiah. So it's Jeremiah 25, uh, starting at verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, against these nations, all around, and utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take them from the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. 70 years. <laughs> now, this prophecy was given around six or seven years before Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah and Jerusalem. We see that Babylon will attack from the north, but look at the language that God uses. Um, he says they'll make them an astonishment. He uses that twice. Uh, desolations, he used that a couple of times as well. I mean, this is terrible. And then he gives them a wee bit more detail in that uh, there'll be a verse 10 talks about stopping festivities. Uh, light, stop and light your candles of weddings. There's also a reference to stop and trade and business. But you'll also notice in verse 11, I put it in the uh, capital, well, bold, um, 70 years. It'll last 70 years. Yes, God will punish, but there's a time limit. God promised that uh, the Messiah would come from David's line. So Israel has to last. So even though the Jews at that time might have thought Israel was finished, that's not, that's not the case. There is a time limit. They won't be in ex exile forever. God will bring them back. The problem for the Jews at this time was that nobody believed Jeremiah. There were false prophets who declared that they would be safe and that they wouldn't be taken into exile. And their confidence was based on a few things. Um, the temple. It was God's temple. And they were God's people. So why on earth would... 
uh, Bab God allow Babylon to destroy the temple, destroy his people. I mean, Jerusalem is God's city. But God wasn't interested in, well, not obviously interested, but his focus was not on the temple. His focus wasn't on the city. His focus was on the people and his relationship with them. And there was also another uh, element that they had confidence in, and that was uh, Egypt. So Egypt was still a player at this time, uh, a military power, and they had supported Judah in the past. So Judah thought that Egypt would come to their aid if Babylon ever attacked. So basically, it was, he was ignored. Uh, J- Jeremiah was ignored. They didn't listen. But um, because they didn't listen, 119 years after the northern kingdom was defeated, Babylon came to Jerusalem. And they came to Jerusalem in three separate well, visitations, I suppose. The first was in 605 BC. That was when they exiled Daniel and his friends. And then 11 years later in 598 BC, they took more people into exile, one of which was Ezekiel, the prophet, and his ministry was based in Babylon. And then 11, 11 years after that, you had the third Babylonian visit, and that's the one where they destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, knocked down the walls, and uh, basically exiled the remainder of the people, or a lot of the remainder of the people. Many of them died from famine uh, during the, um, the siege of Jerusalem, and also many of them were killed by the Babylonians. So when they left, they left a small remnant of the poor in Jerusalem, and they had a governor. Um, so there was an organization there, but it was really small, a very small remnant um, of people that stayed in Jerusalem. But before we kind of move on, I wanted to look at why it was 70 years why was it not 500 or 50 or 100? Well, the reason for 70 years is in Chronicles, uh, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21. And it's, it basically said, To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So that's 2 Chronicles 36. What does it mean, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths? The answer is found in Leviticus 26. Now this details the blessings and the curses, curses of following and forsaking God. So if they rejected God, then God will destroy their cities and bring the land to desolation and the land will enjoy its Sabbaths. But I want you to notice that this is Leviticus. This is a book that Moses uh, wrote. This is hundreds of years beforehand and yet the people knew then the consequence of turning away from God they, it was written down for them Jeremiah in his prophecies he's not telling them anything new, he's basically telling them Leviticus and yet they still didn't believe, they still didn't eh, want to turn back to God and so the consequences were there for them to see but also I want you to see that this doesn't refer to the, the seventh day Sabbath, you know, the day the Lord, that God rested from creation. This refers to the seventh year Sabbath. Now, this is mentioned in Leviticus 25. So basically, uh, the Israelites would sow the land for six years and on the seventh year, let it rest. And there's also a Jubilee Sabbath. Now, many of you will have heard of the year of Jubilee. This came every 50th year. And was uh, was marked with the releasing of people from their debts, releasing slaves, returning property to those who owned it. And also it says that Israelites were not supposed to reap or harvest in that year. So you had the seventh year Sabbaths and also had the 50th year Sabbaths. So God has taken back these Sabbaths all at the same time. 70 Sabbaths covers a period of 490 years, the period from Saul to the Babylonian captivity. So before we get into Israel, I want to look at another prophecy. And this prophecy is in Isaiah. And it's about the king of the Persian Empire. But before we look at it, I just want you to note that this was given over 100 years in advance of the birth of Cyrus. So let's have a wee look at Isaiah. 
So let's read the first one, it's Isaiah 44. Who says of Cyrus, this is God speaking, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all, all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. And again in Isaiah 45, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and loose the armour of kings, to open before him the double door, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you. Now I just want to remind you that Cyrus, who's named twice in Isaiah, is not a Jewish king. He is the ruler of the Persian Empire. Now at the time of Isaiah, this empire didn't exist. and wouldn't exist for over 100 years. The passages we read say that Cyrus will perform God's will and that Jerusalem will be built and the temple foundation laid. And that's exactly what happened um, during the time of Zerubbabel as, as he went back. The, the peoples did come into some difficulties uh, in regards to building the temple, but certainly the foundation was built in the time of Cyrus. Isaiah 45 also says that Cyrus is God's anointed, a title that is only given to Jewish kings, such as King David. But this meant that God would be his, with this ruler. He will raise him up to perform his own will and will help Cyrus with have victory over nations. And I also want you to know that when people read Isaiah, because he's called God's anointed, they may have assumed that Cyrus would be a Jewish king. I'm not sure they would have had in mind that he'd be a Gentile king, a non-Jewish king that would help uh, the Jews or the Israelis uh, in that way. But having these prophecies in mind, let's look at the first few verses in Ezra. So let's read Ezra 1 and uh, we'll read the first four verses. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May his God be with him, and let him go up to the Jerusalem which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings uh, for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So, at the beginning, in verse 1, we see these different prophecies from Isaiah and Jeremiah coming together. A reference is made, not specifically, but it's implied about Jeremiah's 70 years, um, and also to King Cyrus, who was to rebuild Jerusalem and the foundation of the temple that was predicted 150 years before. So this is fulfilled prophecy and adds evidence to the reality of God and the authority of the Bible. This is important on its own when you're talking to people about God, when you're speaking to them about the Bible. Uh, people say, oh, it's just made up, or they don't trust it. And yet here we see two prophecies coming together in one person. Prophecies that were given, well, Jeremiah was given decades before Cyrus, uh, Isaiah's prophecy was over 150 years. So we see these two prophecies coming together, and that kind of validates the, the Bible, kind of proves uh, the kind of supernaturalness of it. So I think that could be useful when you're telling people about God and about his word. But moving on to actually what Cyrus says, it's a, it's a surprise that he's not a believer. Now it doesn't say anywhere that he became a Jew and he worshipped God at the temple. This is a Gentile king saying that God of Israel commanded him to do something. Not one of his own gods, but the God of a small, insignificant nation that was exiled 70 years before. However, it wasn't just the Jews he released. According to an artifact called the Cyrus Cylinder that was created around the same time as this decree, Cyrus released a number of peoples to go back to their lands and worship their own gods. 
saying that when they get home and build their temples, they should ask their gods to give him a long life and a successful reign. So it could be that Cyrus heard the commandment of God and either decided it was a great idea, or he just decided to hedge his bets and he says, look, I'll release all these people, they'll go back to their nations, build their temples and pray, and at least one of the gods will be alive and exist, so either way, I may get some blessing from it. So he released these exiled peoples. But just as an aside, just to let you see that this is still relevant today, things that happened two and a half thousand years ago, because um, I'll show you a picture of this. This is a replica of the Cyrus Cylinder. Now this, you can see this in the headquarters, the UN headquarters in New York. Now the original, certainly it was, uh, it was in the British Museum. And in 2010, they loaned that cylinder for a three month exhibition in Iran. And around 200,000 people came out to catch a glimpse of it. Now you're thinking, well, why? What's so special about it? Well, the thing is about this Cyrus cylinder, it, it, within it, or what's written on it, uh, has been called one of the great declarations of human aspiration. So it's been compared to the American Constitution and also to the Magna Carta. It has been said that Cyrus's empire gave history, and this is a quote, a history, a dream of the Middle East as a unit, and a unit where people of different faiths could live together. It was a general proclamation of freedom of worship and religious tolerance. Now you can see why people are attracted to that idea of a united, peaceful Middle East. But not only does it kind of refer to that in a replica in the UN, also in 2018, when the Israeli Prime Minister visited Washington DC, he hev heavily implied that the American president was Cyrus's spiritual heir. He thanked President Trump for moving the American Embassy to Jerusalem and basically says this is similar to what King Cyrus did all those years ago by letting the Jews go back to Judah to build a temple in Jerusalem. Now, irrespective of politics, the events we're speaking about are two and a half thousand years ago, and yet they still come up. We have the ambition of a peaceful Middle East, and also we have the instrument of God the allowing the Jews to return to their home. So it is still relevant, even from a secular sense, and not only from a spiritual sense, as God uh, seeks to speak to us through this. So let's look again at verse 2 in the statement that Cyrus is making. There is a recognition that the God of heaven gave him these kingdoms and that God gave him commands. My issue is how, could you, how can you remain a non-believer when you know God is real? He, this God has put you in a position of authority. Um, he communicates with you. I mean, talk about overwhelming evidence. I mean, the king... Cyrus worshipped the Babylonian king of gods, Marduk. And I know people will ask God to give them a sign, but Cyrus had more than a sign. He had a message from God, and he mentioned he's mentioned in the Bible before he's born. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe he just liked the benefits of being king, or perhaps the comfort of his own position. But I, I know you'll have the same experience as me. You, you pray for people, and um, you feel that they're given... Uh, very obvious signs that God is real, that God is alive, and God is here, and yet they still don't believe. And yet here's a man here who looking for signs, you know, and yet he still wasn't a believer. It's only some. It's just a bit confusing. Uh, but we trust in God that certainly He knows what He's doing. But then we look at verse 4, and Cyrus refers to something that's very Jewish, uh, a free will offering. Now, we all know about the offering systems, the, the sacrificial systems in the temple. We have the burnt offering, we have the sin offering, the guilt offering, some that are required, others that are voluntary. The free will offering was voluntary. It was an expression of thanks or gratitude to God for his blessings and mercies. So it wasn't meant to be given because you were guilty or felt guilty or or forced that like you had to do it. 
It's included in the statement of Cyrus because it was motivated by thanksgiving, by love, by gratitude to God for bringing his people home, for bringing his people to the promised land. And I was wondering, does that have a parallel with us? When we had the chance, we did go to church, we worshipped God together, uh, we gave free will offerings. These are things like we praised him, we sat under his word, we fellowshiped with each other, we gave our time, our money, our resources. But this should be done with a love, a motivation of love and of gratitude. But how many feel that we have to go to church, that it's a tradition, but it's a habit? But rather than maybe being an inconvenience, this should be something that we should be doing cheerfully. Now, I know we haven't been at church for a while, and so when we go back, it will be that. We will we'll have that enthusiasm and um, that gratitude. Um, but over the years, we have to be mindful that God has done so much for us um, that we should respond to him in love. It's not something we have to do because our salvation is in Christ, but it's something that we do to express our thanks, to express our love uh, to God uh, for that great salvation. Now, some of you might think, well, Douglas, back in the day, you know, back when the Jews were like this, it must have been a lot more real for them, must have been a bit more, um, I don't know, just tangible for them. But certainly for these Jews, it wasn't easy. They had a four-month journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. Um, and the Jerusalem wouldn't have been occupied for decades. So you'll have major repairs to houses uh, that have not been occupied for years, would have been potentially destroyed in the battle. You'll have fields that have to be um, prepared for any agriculture. And then you'll have at least three generations of people that are travelling. So you've got like the over 70s, the elderly, and then you've got babies, you've got the kind of adults, but then you've got other children that are walking around. So you have to get all these people from one place to another with all their worldly goods. It wouldn't have been an easy journey. But when they reach Jerusalem, they are to set up an altar and worship God, giving thanks for returning them home. And we'll see that in the coming weeks. So... Just to bring this together, I know it's only been an introduction, but there's things we can see already, looking at the history of Israel and the prophecy leading up to it. We see God's faithfulness. His people were faithless, but God was faithful. He disciplined his people, but he never forgot them. He promised they would come back in 70 years, and that's what happened. I'm sure there were times when the people doubted that God would keep his promise, but he did, and again, that should be an example to us as we sometimes doubt God, but he keeps his promises. We see God's plan. Now, he named Cyrus as the king, 150 years before the event, that he would set his people free and go back to Israel. And that happened. So why do we find it difficult to know that God has a plan and to trust in that plan? Thirdly, we see God working through a secular government. Now... Sometimes we get a bit discouraged when we're reading the, new, reading the news or whatever about what our government is doing, what it's saying. But be rest assured, the government is not out with the control of God. It's important, yes, that we pray for all levels of government, whether it's the local council, the Scottish government, UK government, as Paul says in Second Timothy. But be aware that it's not out with God's control if God chooses to come and work through them. Fourthly, we see God uses an unexpected source to bless his people. I doubt many people would have thought that God used a king of Persia to free and provide for his people, but that's exactly what he did. Even the people in Isaiah's day, or even when they're in um, Babylonian captivity, looking at Isaiah's prophecy, they probably thought Cyrus would have been a Jewish uh, king, the God God's anointed, but no it came from an unexpected source. So we should also be expecting to for God to use unexpected things to bless his people. And lastly, we see thankfulness. The people are encouraged to present a free will offering because they're able to go back to the promised land to worship God. 
and a free will offering symbolising an outpouring of thankfulness to God. I know things are difficult just now. I know many of us are struggling. But it's always very important that despite these struggles, that we still have a thankfulness to God, a thankfulness for the blessings that he's given us, and also a realisation that he's got more blessings to give us. As if we believe in him, that we will have um, life eternal. So that is kind of the introduction that we'll have for Ezra. Next week, we'll get more into the, the scriptures and see what they have to say to us. But for now, why don't we just finish with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come and we thank you for your word to us today. Uh, we thank you for the book of Ezra and all that you can teach us through it. I do pray you would uh, really speak to us through that, your word and you would help us understand where it is in the biblical narrative, but also what you would have to say to us through it. The days we're living in just now are unusual. Uh, they're certainly strange, unprecedented. And yet, Lord, you are still God. And I ask that you would help us be mindful of that uh, each day. But help us trust in your faithfulness, trust in your plan, trust that you uh, know all things and have all things in your hand. And help us, Lord, be thankful. Not be uh, scared, worried, um, in despair, but Lord, that we be truly thankful and rest in your presence and in your promises. So truly be with us, Lord, I pray. Part is with your blessing and help us as we would seek to uh, glorify you. Because even in this time of struggle, I pray that you would help us draw others to yourself, that they would be saved, that they would have that eternal relationship with you. So be with us, Lord, I pray in your name. Amen. Well, I hope to see you next time, um, but have a, a great week and uh, may God bless you.